Dan Wells is a horror writer whose first book, I Am Not a Serial Killer, is already huge in Europe. It comes out in the United States in March 2010. But, but in the reader's mind, what we're trying to do is take you from a state where he's sane to one where he's insane. And so the death, when he actually does it, when he actually follows through, that's when the reader starts to go, okay, yeah, this guy probably is crazy. Because we all think about killing people, right? I'm not the only one. Okay. Plot turn two. Um, we need that last piece of the puzzle. He killed a guy, but now we need to just drive it home that he is completely bonkers, and we do that by having him hear the heart still beating under the floorboards. And that's when we go, okay, this guy's nuts. Okay, we need to provide some pressure there, and we are going to do so. First thing he does is he tries to kill the old guy eight times, and he can't do it because his eye's closed. And then finally, on the eighth time, he opens the door, and the guy's eye is open. He says, all right, you are dead, sucker. And he jumps on him, and he kills him. So there's our pinch one to provide kind of a lot of suspense there in the beginning. Pinch two, we get all our suspense at the end with the cops. Somebody said cops. Police officers come to the house and say, hey, we heard a scream. And he invites him in and sits him down on a chair right over where the body is buried. And then there's this tense scene where he's talking to them and he hears some creepy thing, and it just builds up, and then he ends up by screaming, no, his heart's still beating even though he's dead, and so now we know that he's crazy. So, there's our horror plot, which is a little different from our other ones. Okay, now as we mentioned, these stories are not complete. You still need to add all this extra stuff to flesh them out. We are not gonna talk about round characters and rich environments because you guys, all, you can do that, you're geniuses. We're going to talk about the plot-based ones. We're going to talk about the Ice Monster Prologue. We're going to talk about Trifail Cycles. And then we're going to combine them all together. Lots of different plots. So, Ice Monster Prologue. Who has read Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin? Wow, more people have read Othello than George R. R. Martin? I don't know whether that's happy or not. <laughs> anyway, um, Game of Thrones, great book. Um, it does not have, it's a, it's a big epic fantasy story does not have a lot of action for quite a few pages. And it's a magic, it's a fantasy, doesn't have a lot of magic in it for like three-fourths of the book. But it starts with a prologue where some guys fight an ice monster. And so that tells you right off the bat, this is going to have action and it's going to have magic, so just bear with me now while we talk about this kid growing up. So we see this a lot because the first scene of a hook it's not necessarily interesting. I hate to break that to you guys. We have Batman starting off in a position of weakness. We have, you know, Harry Potter living under the stairs. Um, the conflict isn't introduced yet. There's a lot of things that just haven't happened yet. The thing is, we want people to still be reading this book 20 chapters from now, which means we need to hook them now. But right now, we're busy laying the foundation for 20 chapters later. So. You see this all the time. The Ice Monster Prologue is just what I call it because of Game of Thrones. Um, let's you start with something that will grab people before the actual story is going to grab them. There we go. We have Luke. This is the, the arc of our story here is little farm boy becomes a Jedi. But we don't start with a farm boy. We start with a space battle. Okay? Matrix. Our arc is little hacker becomes a Jedi. But we don't start with the little hacker. We start with the hot chick in tight black leather who beats up the bad guys. Okay? That's the hook that gets people in. They get people invested, and then we start laying our foundation for our long thing. You do not need to do this. Plenty of stories don't do this, but a surprising number of them do. Okay? So that is a good way to just get people ready. That's a great way to start a story, to start a book. Say, try fail cycles. Who knows what a try fail cycle is? Somebody just shout it out. Oh my goodness, that is the most confusing concept ever. OK, before your heroes succeed at anything important, they should try and fail multiple times first. Why? Because victory should be earned. Because if your heroes can solve the problem on the first try, then your problem was not hard enough, and nobody cares. So we need lots of try-fail cycles to get people going. Try-fail cycles can serve a lot of different purposes. They can demonstrate consequences. In The Last Crusade, we get to the last room, and the knight says, choose wisely, 
The good one gives you eternal life, and the bad one will do horrible things. We don't know what the horrible thing is. And when Indy chooses, there's not a lot of tension in the audience, because we don't know what the consequences of a wrong choice are. So we get to see the consequences first, when the other guy chooses. So we have tried, we have failed, and now the audience knows, oh, this is serious. All right. Sometimes try fail cycles. <laughs> Why does this always get the biggest laugh? OK, sometimes try fail cycles look like victories. Wesley's trying to rescue Buttercup. He has to go through all three guys before he can do it. Yes, he beats the first two. He beats them all. But in beating them, he does not immediately gain his objective. He has to pass these obstacles first, and that makes his eventual victory more satisfying. On the other hand, Sometimes failures are actual failures. <laughs> we have poor Inigo. How many times does Inigo um, try and fail to avenge his father's death? Let's look at him. We have, uh, he, he starts off by asking the man in black. He says, do you know this? And he says, no, I don't, and I'm going to beat you up. And then the man in black finds the six-fingered man, but they kill him. <laughs> then we discover it's Count Rugen, and then he's too drunk to do anything about it. And then he finally confronts him, and the dude runs away. And then he tries to get through the door, and it's locked. And then he gets through the door, and he gets stabbed in the stomach. And then, after 10 try-fail cycles, he finally does what he's trying to do. That's why this is the best moment in the movie. That's why this is everyone's favorite, because he earned it. He tried really hard, and he got what he wanted, and he failed, and we were with him the whole way. So that's why try-fail cycles are really important to have. So moving on now, plots and subplots. We need to have lots and lots of them. Most stories have more than one plot. As we had the question at the beginning, what if you're trying to focus on character and plot at the same time? Most stories do. If you look at a TV show, every TV show on television, except the ones I don't watch, um, <laughs> has two plots going at the same time. Here's our main plot. Here's our B plot. And each thread. Each action, each resolution or climax that you are working toward can be mapped out with this system. And then you weave them all together. You've got all these little threads going at once, and you kind of weave them together until to get, you get something useful. So we're going to do this with the matrix, OK? We're going to put everything that we've talked about all into one thing. The way I look at the matrix, it's got four plots, three main plots and a subplot of the betrayal. And they all end thusly. In our action plot, this is where Neo has to defeat the agents. That's kind of our overarching thing. We also have a character plot where he needs to become the one. He needs to grow as a person, and he needs to know that the power is in him. We have a romance plot where we're trying to get these two characters to fall in love with each other. This, as we see, is a very standard hero's journey. We have our call to action. We have our mentor disappearing. We have all of the standard hero's journey stuff. Character plot, very different. We are instead building towards a character climax, an internal climax, where he has to realize things and make decisions about himself. We have our romance plot, which is not necessarily all that different from the Pride and Prejudice one. Sorry for the blasphemy there. Um, but when you bring it down to a structural level, a romance tends to be fairly the same. Now, we have our betrayal plot, which is Cypher. We're trying to build toward a moment in which Cypher betrays everybody. That's our subplot that we're going to mix in there and blend in there. So all of these four plots, they have our seven points. Now we're going to braid them together. The way we do this is we have our events. We spread them out to give ourselves good pacing. There's the one time I'll say that during this pacing. I don't, I'm, I'm sorry that pacing was on there. So all of you people who came for pacing, there you go, pacing, spread them out. Now, on the other hand, we're going to line those moments back up again when we need to create a really powerful scene. We're going to have different important things happening in different plots, and they happen at the same time. Those are the big scenes that get us going and that we remember and that have a big impact on us. So let's look at them.